one of the stories I get asked to tell sometimes is how did we land Uber? I won't like necessarily get into its entirety, but the point is that I was essentially invited to a dinner where I didn't know anybody except for the person who invited me. And we were leaving this dinner, which was fine. I hopped into a taxi and there's a knock on the window. The person's like, I'm going to the same after party you are. Can I hitch a ride? So of course, hop in. And I was like, hey, I'm Jonathan. And at the time, Thrive was like five people or something. I was like, I run a small agency in Vancouver. Uh, and he's like, hey, I'm Garrett Camp. I founded Uber. And so I met the founder of Uber. In this episode, I'm talking to Jonathan Becker, CEO and founder of Thrive Digital, a leading digital marketing agency based in North America with clients like Uber, Slack, and Lululemon. We're going to talk about number one, his journey in the digital marketing agency world and how he made it to the top 5% of all digital marketing agencies out there. Number two, we're going to talk about his leading marketing channel. What is it and why does it work so well? We're going to try to figure out things like number one, his revenue, News. number two is marketing budget number three how he sees the market environment right now we're supposedly in a recession but he's still signing very very big clients and lastly we're going to try to figure out things like how much he actually pays himself as the ceo and founder and every single time he cannot answer a question we both have to take a shot of hot sauce wish me luck martians i hope you enjoy this one hello hello martians welcome back to another episode of marketing on mars Today, I'm really excited. We have a local founder. Finally, after 60 episodes, we're bringing in another local founder based in the beautiful city of Vancouver, British Columbia in Canada. We have Jonathan Becker. He is the founder of Thrive Digital, um, one of the largest, if not the largest, digital marketing agencies or paid performance marketing agencies in North America. Jonathan, thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited. And not the biggest agency, but one of them for sure. One of them. You know the exact is there like a like a Sportsnet or TSN top ten for agencies in North America? I think it depends how you look at it. You could look at that as, you know, team size, you could look at it as revenue, uh, you could look at it as, you know, EBITDA maybe, although that information's tougher to get. So but, you know, we're we're one of the larger ones in British Columbia where we're based for sure. And in terms of the business that we take on, we're pretty dominant in the United States. Yeah, I've um, just thrown out some num- some names here. I'm sure all of our, our listeners already know some of the pl- past clients that you've worked with include Uber, um, Lululemon, uh, Slack. Asana, just big, big names. So I'm really excited to dive into it. Um, before we do any of that, uh, we, we met a few weeks ago. I told you the theme of the show. We're going to start off the show with a shot of hot sauce. I'm going light today because I didn't eat any breakfast. Uh, so I'm just going to go Frank's, but I will load up the spoon. I got like this big, <laughs> big spatula spoon. Uh, this is going to be my weapon of choice. What do you have today? What's your weapon of choice? Um, I've got today? some Yucatan sunshine. I'm hoping oh. you don't make me eat too, too much of this, um, but I'm ready. I got it looks delicious, safe. though. It's Safeway, by the way. Ah, Safeway. Cool, cool. Um, yeah, I love habanero. It, it is a very nice pepper to start off with. So let's, why don't you, let's, uh, let's, let's do this together. Yeah, sounds good. Start with a little dab. All right. Cheers. All right. Cheers. It's so sour. Well, that's really hot. It's not even, it's not um, even spicy. It's just, I love it's just hot sour. Sauce, but I don't usually eat it by the spoonful. <laughs> and so. Oh, really? This is going to be. A oh, that's food. so weird. <laughs> that's how all my family and friends, uh, that's how we all eat our hot sauce. Of course. We just, yeah, we just, we just spoon it down. <laughs> okay, so I'm I've had a chance to look through your bio. You've you started your 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 digital marketing agency almost 13 years ago, and you guys have grown to over 200, um, well over 100 employees now that I can see on LinkedIn at least. Mm-hmm. Uh, but before that, uh, you've done so much, and you've been you're a board member at so many different companies right now locally. Uh, including Outway, Children's Hospital, um, Aero Press, and before that, 
you know, SFU, which is a very notable university here. Talk to us a little bit about how you would kind of summarize your career and your journey and, and uh, kind of talking about like how everything led you to where you're at today. Okay. Um, yeah. So uh, thanks for the question. It's thoughtful. I think um, I'll, I'll say that I had the absence of a plan and my career was more um, finding out what I didn't want and understanding that really well than necessarily having like a North star I was focused on. So um, to a degree, if you look at like my LinkedIn profile, you just rattled off a couple things, but like, you know, I, I'm involved in the community. Um, I always kind of have been, whether it's through the educational world or now in my, you know, capacity as a board member at BC Children's Hospital, which I'm really proud of the foundation, not the hospital. Um, and then, um, a lot of, um, you know, what happened to me was the result of just really, uh, determined focus, um, some failure along the way. And then ultimately, you know, really doubling down on things that seem to be working. So you could look at me as a failed web developer who became obsessed with search engine optimization, um, started getting known in the world of search, and then eventually transitioned from organic search into paid search where folks not only in Vancouver, but in, you know, all over the United States and different parts of Canada and ultimately all over Europe and other parts of the world started uh, reaching out to us for support around, you know, building these functions into their companies. And so I've had a really interesting journey, um, which has, a you know, just to name drop, I guess, because that's probably the most recognizable stuff here. But we worked with uh, Steve Jobs' wife, Laureen, for a long time. Uh, Bill Gates was a client of mine, and that was really interesting. I got to have dinner with him once. Um, wow. uh, Charlie Munger, so Warren Buffett's business partner, you know, has been uh, a client of ours, um, and I might be, you know, visiting them soon. I've had dinner with him as well. Um, so I think that um, outside of the work itself, you know, having these really amazing opportunities, not only to meet people like that who are themselves kind of like artifacts of history in one way or another. Um, but also the opportunities to work with the people who run these really interesting companies that we um, have in our lives on a day-to-day -day basis has been really, really rewarding for me. But, um, you know, some people kind of have a master plan and they go to school for something or whatever. I'm an example of someone who is a little bit more aimless. When I walked across, you know, the stage to graduate at UVic, where I got my arts degree, I distinctly remember asking myself, what am I going to do now? I had no idea. And so my career was, you know, the result of a bunch of guessing and testing, uh, essentially happy to unpack that further. If you want. We're, we're going to unpack your career near the end. We're going to unpack thrive digital as well. But first, how do you meet people like Bill Gates, Charlie Munger, Steve jobs, wife and Steve jobs as I don't know. Did you meet Steve Jobs before he passed? No, I didn't, unfortunately. No. But I have met his whole family, more or less. How do you meet people? And I and I know you locally, obviously in Vancouver. But maybe for other, uh, a lot of our audience members are outside of Vancouver. They probably don't know the scene too too well. But you know, like all the who is who's in Vancouver. How do you how do you get into that? Did you did you already have like the, the you like you know a lot of um, were you well connected through your family members and stuff before that, or did you have to make your own network, build your own network? Um, I, I wasn't particularly well connected starting off. I came from like a uh, middle class family. Uh, I grew up in a nice part of town, um, but it's not like I had you know connections that launched me forward. Certainly, my family wasn't wealthy or anything like that. So I think that um, the short answer is relationships and community that ultimately generated referrals. So, and then in certain places and times, um, kind of trying to insert yourself into communities of people where you might by happenstance interact with some of these folks. So like I can get into the specifics of some of the people you just mentioned, but like uh, one of the stories I get asked to tell sometimes is like, how did we land Uber? And I won't like necessarily get into that in its entirety, but the point is that I was essentially invited to a dinner 
where I didn't know anybody except for the person who invited me. Um, and there was an after. Where was it? Dinner. Pardon? Where was it? The, this is the uh, 2013 in Long Beach, California. And I was at a conference and um, uh, we were leaving this dinner, which was fine. Uh, I hopped into a taxi and there's a knock on the window. Uh, the person, you know, I roll down the window and the person's like, I'm going to the same, you know, after party you are. Can I, can I hitch a ride? So of course, you know, hop in. Um, and, uh, I was like, Hey, I'm Jonathan. And at the time thrive was like five people or something. I was like, I run a small agency in Vancouver. Uh, and he's like, Hey, I'm Garrett camp. I, I founded Uber. And so I met the founder of Uber in the back of a taxi. Crazy. So that was just like dumb luck kind of like, um, but then what happened beyond that was capitalizing on the luck. So I think to a degree you make your own luck. So it wasn't an entire, you know, accident that I was in at that dinner in the first place. We can talk about that a bit if you want. Um, but I think that, um, you know, having the ability to see a situation for what it is and then shoot your shot, uh, is really important. And a lot of people I've spoken about this before, but a lot of people are stopped by themselves. So they get nervous they're worried about downside they're worried about you know saying something that sounds dumb or whatever and in my mind i was like the downside here is that i pitched this guy like in other words like my five person agency at the time i wanted to have us work with uber so i was like i could pitch this guy and you know if i get rejected we already don't work with uber so the worst thing that happens is that we just simply continue to not work with Uber. continue to not work yeah yeah. But the upside is massive and that's what happened. And so we end up, you know, it's a long kind of complicated story, but ultimately we land Uber and we worked with them for 10 years and it was a wonderful relationship and, um, you know, saw Thrive grow through a bunch of stages and lent us some notoriety that was really interesting at the time. Um, the other people that you mentioned, um, I'm just trying to think. The, the Bill Gates group, I met people from his team again at a conference I was at. And I honestly just had a relationship with them for a number of years. And then at a certain point when it came time, uh, you know, they had a need and we partnered with them and it was, they considered us because they knew us. Um, Lorene Jobs was an intro. Um, Charlie Munger was a several different intros, I would say. So I got introduced to Charlie a couple different ways. Yeah. So we've had two other agencies, actually, no, just one other agency before you, and you might know them, Applied Digital, they're yeah. local in yeah, Vancouver. Guys are great. So, so, so we had Gautam, uh, founder and CEO, come on the show, and now you're the second one. And obviously, I've met a lot of agency founders in my time. Um, and I would say this, I'd say, I think the superpower of most agency founders that become successful there's only one thing that really sets them apart is they're, they're, they are master networkers and they, they have, they have developed this craft. And I, I don't want to use networking in, in, in the sense that, you know, you're constantly talking to people mm -hmm. to turn them into leads. It's not that yeah. I think in order to be a successful agency, first of all, it takes many years. You will not, not become successful in one or two years. Um, and you guys, the most successful agency founders have have the best reputation because right. it only takes one bad reputation and then the whole, whole city will know that you are a bad agency. So the fact, it just speaks volumes. The fact that you've been running this agency for 13 years and you have a good good enough reputation that people are referring you. So right. talk to us. I just want to hear your thoughts on that. Like, do you agree with that yeah. as the number one superpower? Or do you think there's another superpower for agency, successful agency owner? You brought up a couple good points and I'll give you my take on them. So number one, um, we absolutely have made mistakes along the way and we've had projects that did not work out. So I don't want it to appear as if we're like infallible. If anything, it's the mistakes that we've made and the way that we've handled those and learned from them that made us great. The other thing is yes. that my mentality yes. before we were big on day one was that whether I was right or not, I knew I was the absolute best in the industry. I kicked ass on our number one of the company. And really what that meant to me is I was just very confident in my craft. Um, 
super confident. And I, for, for better or for worse, I was a subject matter expert. So it wasn't like, uh, you know, fake. I, I really did know what I was doing. And my business partner, yeah. who I have nothing but admiration and respect for, also was like a total expert in his field. So when it's just the two of us and suddenly we become, you know, thrive, so to speak, um, we walk into these rooms with swagger and confidence. Um, but also, you know, a sense of humor about ourselves that we're not perfect. Um, what you refer to as networking, I hate that word. I know it's, Me too. it's common. Um, I don't think about anything as networking. I think about it as just meeting people and talking to people. And so the one thing that I would say um, that was maybe key to my mindset that maybe is different is that I never um, saw, I never looked at these people as being above me or superior. I just saw them as like other folks that I was having conversations with. So I would speak to them as equals. Uh, so I had an interesting experience in high school where, so I guess you asked me if I was like, if I had special connections, although I really wouldn't count this as one because I don't think I've spoken to the guy in like 10 years, but Seth Rogen was in my homeroom class at Point Grey where we went to high school together. And so this oh, guy was like always funny and like the class clown and like, you know, super respected. He wasn't like nerdy or anything like that. He was like a well-adjusted guy. People liked him a lot, I would say. And then when he suddenly becomes famous, we were like, wait a minute, like, he's just like a dude, like he's just Seth. Like now he's like an A-list celebrity. People worship him. He has like millions of followers, you know, it's crazy. But at the same time, the reason I mention this is because it planted this notion in my head, this realization maybe that these, you know, these figures that people celebrate and worship sometimes are just other people. And so just people. they're just people and they have their own problems yeah. and they have their own stories and there's success and there's failure and they're just people. And so they don't want to be fanboyed. They just want you to talk to them like they're normal as human people. people. Yeah. yeah. And, so, and you know, yeah. I guess as a, you interview a lot of founders, I think, and, um, my startup story in my view is you know equally fun and interesting as like any of these others even if other people had much bigger companies and stuff and so there was never i never allowed like there to be any degree of like you know measuring stick in terms of revenue or profit or whatever i just walked in with swagger and i had good stories and i would tell them and that was it and so and um yeah, it kind of becomes like a force multiplier where, you know, you have that confidence, you know, you're good. And then people are, are gravitate towards you. And it has like a multiplying effect. The bigger you get, the more the magnet, you know, is strengthened, I guess. So that's how exactly. it should work. The other thing that I should mention, by the way, is like, you could be the best relationship person in the world. But if you can't handle the execution properly, you will go nowhere. So we were very, very sensitive and meticulous to the execution at every stage of our, of our company. And it does not mean that we get everything right, but it, you know, these things like tend not to happen by accident in organizations. You have to plan out process. You have to understand people's strengths and weaknesses. You have to think about it as like a, a sports team where you have like different people with different specializations. And you have to yeah. know who to play on your front line when it's like a regular period versus when it's like, you know, the last minute in the Stanley Cup playoff in game seven type thing. And so you kind of have to play your team like it's a team. And then having a bench ready as well. Always constantly bench. thinking about a bench. Yeah. Absolutely. Have a deep bench. You have to have a, a solid bench of players. We always refer to it as the deep bench because, you know, you need like, lots of talent and some people get injured or sick or whatever it is and you still have to be able to yeah. finish the game or some people leave because they found a better team yeah there's yeah totally the right? there's so yeah. many teams out there right 100%. Uh, oh man we can talk about sports analogies for hours but <laughs> uh i want to say you mentioned you don't like to compare revenue when you walk in the room and all that one of our favorite hot sauce questions of course, we want to know how you guys are doing and you know what's coming. Uh, 
what are you guys doing right now in terms of revenue? Uh, we're in the 20 something million range in terms of revenue. I don't mind. I don't normally oh. talk about that, but I'm also on one hand trying I, I, to avoid. I had my that. hot sauce. Yeah, yeah, I had my hot sauce ready. Okay, I bought the hot sauce question. Okay, so you guys are at uh, 20 million. Um, We're growing, and um, you know, I I think uh, so. I went and saw um, Jason Freed speak uh, last night. He's the base camp founder from 37 Signals. Really interesting. Yeah. Guy. One of the things that he talked about that I completely agree with um, was that he doesn't care about revenue. He cares about profit. So um, we kind of have run our business historically without like crazy financial reporting and, you know, uh, QBR goals. And like we, we have some of that stuff, but it at the end of the day, the business has to make more than it spends. And as long as it's doing that and there's like a little yeah. bit of growth, I'm really yeah. happy. We've seen a lot of growth over the years and we continue to be fiercely competitive and land really interesting clients. But like, there's a lot of people who, you know, these days think about their businesses as a function of like, I'm going to raise money, I'm going to borrow money, I'm going to do this. And they create organizations that have plenty of revenue, but lose all kinds of money. And so that's not a real business to me. Sometimes they have exits because they manage to go public and that business will continue to borrow money or raise money somehow. But for me, it was just always a question of like, once you've started the business, can the business stay afloat? <laughs> and that's like, that's much harder than starting the business. Um, and I had to make sure that every month we had, you know, money left over in the bank account, basically. And so, you know, maybe that was a less popular way of looking at companies over the last 10 years. And now it's kind of coming back into fashion because uh, the way, you know, the economy is functioning, but, um, that's the only thing I really care about. Well, I think especially for agencies, when all you have are people, yeah. it's not like you have a lot of IPs or you don't have a product that you're selling or you're not putting a lot of R and D, like all you have are your people and talent is so important. Yeah. Well, um, we, we do have more yeah. than people. I would say like to, to be frank. So when you start out, you have your team and the team is the, absolutely the most valuable and critical thing. Like there's nothing more important than the people that work with us. Um, but over time, I think what separates good agencies from great agencies is yeah. innovating in this place where like some people don't know what they don't know. And we go there and try and unpack that. And so, you know, it results in process uh, a certain degree of acumen experience um not like big dumb you know administration type stuff but just like a degree of understanding of what comes next that might be more sophisticated than um other organizations and we tend to have this like brain trust of that at the company and irrespective of people going back and forth that brain trust is constantly expanding and then we also do Love have software that. that we've built to manage, you know, an array of different things. And so there is some IP there too, but I agree with you that, you know, the, the majority of the value of it, of an agency is human capital, um, and the talented people that work there for sure. We'd be nothing without that. So hot sauce I, question, hot sauce question number two, what, what is your guys' profit nowadays? Uh, I'm going to have to have a spoon of hot sauce with you. So what, what I will say is we, we have always been profitable and we have never not been profitable and we continue to be profitable. And I actually think yeah. that's unbelievably rare, at least in the city that I'm from. Um, even most agencies aren't always profitable. And so Thrive has been yeah. like this one in 10,000 business. Honestly, it's been incredible. People try and kind of buy us all the time. It's interesting. Uh, we're having a lot of fun, and it's profitable, so we want to continue owning it. Let's. And you don't have a. It doesn't look like you have any gray hairs, so you must you must be happy. Hair. <laughs> <laughs> you must have a really good partner, or uh, or uh, or you're having a lot of fun. All right, cheers. <laughs> cheers. Um. Oh man, I should have picked like a much more mild hot sauce. Wow. Okay. We should have switched. I really don't like sour. Um, it's funny because I have a bottle of Frank's um, in my fridge and I was like, I thought you'd make fun of me if I brought that. And here you are. <laughs> it, it's not even, it's, I would prefer spicy. I, 
So you you know I'm working out of WeWork today. Yeah. Representing the 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 WeWork. Um and so I didn't bring any of my hot sauce. And then but they always have Franks available. So wait, you're telling me that that is from the cafeteria at WeWork? Yeah. You're the hot sauce guy on this hot sauce podcast and you forgot to bring hot sauce to your own podcast? I I Yes, I, I got nothing else to say to that. An extra swig of the of the bottle just for that. I feel like I feel like I should, right? Wow, you just <laughs> like, got a penalty, man. <laughs> that's a yellow. That's a yellow card, man. That's a yellow card. Um, okay, because this is a marketing show, let's dive into marketing. Um, you know, typically, typically when we get uh, founders on, they're they're building some kind of product, right? Some kind of B two B or B two C product, some kind of SaaS product, um, and so we talk about their channels. With marketing agencies, we kind of know their channels already, but maybe you can just really briefly touch upon like how you guys get new clients, like what kind of activities you guys are are doing. Uh, for sure, and you know, I've I've. Um... I'm a bit of a fan, so I've heard, you know, you interview a bunch of other people and uh, I think the way I'll answer this question is probably a little bit different. So, uh, number yeah. one, um, you know, the, we talked about this a bit, the primary driver of new business for Thrive is referrals. And so the question becomes, how do you generate referrals? Um, we always thought about the work that we do as our marketing. So asterisk. I live in a world where most of the stuff we do is secret. I can't talk to you about some of the clients we work with. I can't, I certainly can't talk to you about, you know, the budgets that we're managing. I can tell you that Thrive manages about 500 million a year, but like, I can't tell you who's spending what. I can't tell you what we're doing, you know, in order to uh, really win on certain projects. There's a lot that I'm not able to share because it's confidential, right? You, you wouldn't want me spilling the beans on what's working for your company either type thing. So it's easy to understand. However, um, when we do things correctly, you know, as it happens, people either stay at companies or move to different companies or they themselves right. have friends, you know, at other companies that are in the same, you know, slice of the industry that they are. And so people talk, people move around and it tends to generate a lot of referrals. So we have found that, the harder we work and the better we are and the more badass we are at like really driving things forward, the bigger our business gets. It's a tough thing to measure. And there's maybe only a certain degree of scale, you know, that you can really achieve uh, with referrals. But it's been like a major yeah. driver for us for 13, 14 years. Certainly it was what started my career out as well. Um, so that's the main thing. We also eat our own dog food. We run paid search for ourselves. That's an incredibly profitable and scalable channel. And we tend to scale paid search up or down based on you know, wh when we want more leads or not. And that is a function, frankly, of the capacity that we have. So we only have 120 people. There's only so many projects we're willing to take before we can't perform on the projects to the degree that we know we need to. And so, and yet there's client churn, clients come and go. And so it's all somewhat this like, you know, calculation in terms of like, what organic referrals are we getting? What are we yeah. getting through paid search? Um, and then there's a couple of other in, you know, interesting areas that I think we're working on. So we have learned a lot about our industry. I mentioned, you know, we have a ton of in institutional knowledge. And for a long time, we kind of thought of that as like our secret sauce. But then we realized that we probably maybe even missed an opportunity to talk about some of the things that we're learning publicly because sharing these things builds an audience and ultimately an audience is a form of relationship. And as we've done stuff like, you know, beyond podcasts or, you know, contribute uh, to someone else's editorial publication or whatever it may be, um, referrals come out of that. And so we're kind of like, you know, we should be better at sharing the things that we're learning and that's okay because we're always learning and we're always innovating. And so there's always going to be like more things that, um, are a little bit, you know, tucked out away that we don't talk about that maybe we'll share later, if that makes sense. So going to try to summarize this referrals, number one, paid search, number two, 
and then just kind of content sharing number three um, like these are your top yeah, three we're, we're building up our content marketing muscle i would say and that's going to result in us ultimately launching a newsletter and our blog and a number of other things that's going to take years for us to really not only perfect in terms of like how do we show up and what voice do we talk to people through but also just yeah. to grow an audience that cares and so uh we have a lot of interesting things to talk about and say so i think that you know that will happen but uh, it's a bit of a long-term push. Well, hopefully you guys don't get into the podcast game because we don't need any more marketing podcast. <laughs> you, know, you know what I'm saying? Uh, no plans for that right now. <laughs> so, Rafael's obviously very, very big. And when I when I talk to other CMOs, successful CMOs, successful CEOs and founders, ones who can win in referrals just always tend to skyrocket above any other because word of mouth is the number one channel we see we hear it time and time again what is your what do you think is your secret sauce like what is your superpower when it comes to referrals how do you get people to talk about you to other friends because that's the number one way right so i mean uh the bulk of referrals happen themselves so um i'll get a, a wow. cold email from someone and they're like, so and so gave me your, you know, coordinates, your email, whatever. Uh, would you would you be interested in talking to us about working together? We have like this problem and this problem. So that's like ninety percent of the time. Ten percent wow. of the time, let's call it, I will generate referrals and I'll say, hey, so and so, I saw that you were here. You know, you, you I know you from here. We work together. They they know who I am. Maybe um, now you're over here. I'd love to talk to you about you know um, that project you're working on or uh, sometimes it's even like hey uh, so and so who I know I noticed you're connected to this person uh, would you mind making an intro I'm really interested in speaking to them about this and that and so what I will say about this is I'm probably one of the like more successful salespeople in our industry right and it's resulted in this like you know pretty large company type thing um, but that said, I think what made me successful is that I am very comfortable getting rejected a lot. So when I do that 10% outbound piece, which is important, like we've, we've landed some really interesting projects that you way. Do it personally yourself? Or do you I do it personally myself? Yeah, I enjoy it. it. It's like, it doesn't feel like work to me. We have a sales team, so they're doing yeah. all kinds of stuff too, right? But, but yeah. I still kind of do my thing, right? And uh, that that's a whole other discussion we can talk about, but... Um, wow. I get rejected a lot of the time and that my being rejected or like people just not responding is my expectation. As I mentioned earlier, my expectation and my thought process is, you know, there, I, I don't do it in a way where I'm annoying to the person. I'll, I'll literally reach out one time. Um, and typically it's because there's something utilitarian about like what I'm discussing with them. My expectation is that they will not respond or my expectation is that it's not a good time or that, you know, they'll say something like, thanks, but whatever, no type thing. Um, if it so happens that we get into a conversation, end up in an RFP, end up working on their project, that is huge. Um, but my expectation is always very low and I'm very comfortable getting shot down all the time. And so, and in my view, that's the difference between, again, a good salesperson versus like a great person. You have to expect rejection and failure a lot and and be willing to just keep going and push through that. So yeah, I don't, did I answer your question there? No, I, you, you did, you did. I, I mean, it, it's just incredible uh, what, what you've done. And I think you constantly, you, you talked about this earlier, just constantly, believing in your craft and always perfecting your craft, that gives you so much confidence to sell what you're about to sell. Cause you know that you always have the best team. Yeah. Right. So yeah. having, when you have LeBron James, you know, on your team constantly and like a roster of them, you'll go out there and you'll sell tickets. You'll sell tickets to your game because you know that your games are always going to be really, really good. And yeah. you're probably going to win, you know, nine times out of 10. And that kind of confidence probably helps a lot, right? So how yeah. much how much time do you spend on on 
constantly building systems for teams and making sure talent is there. Do you do this yourself or do you have someone else who you, that you kind of delegate this to? Um, I do not do that myself. And there's a bunch of talented people who do that. But a big part of, you know, just to unpack what you said or double click on it or whatever you want to call it a little bit, um, sometimes it's very obvious during the hire process that someone is like a first round draft pick. We'll keep using sports analogies. But in another instance, usually what happens is you get a bunch of like really exciting rookies, if you will, on your team, and you develop them as team members, players. Yes. Right? And yes. so that's really the way to do this. Like, of course, you can spot talent, and talent occasionally is undeniable, but generally speaking, it's about you know, developing these, these folks on the team. Now, what we realized early on as well is that sometimes we would put people on projects and the outcome would be less than good. Um, and yet these people seem talented and really smart and had like very interesting backgrounds and they, they were good people. And what we realized is a lot of times when they failed in a project situation, it was because we as the company hadn't built proper support around them and so 100%. folks are not necessarily always you know swiss army knives of different skills you have to assess like which skills do they have are they good at shooting the puck skating passing the puck you know wh whatever it is and some people are like really good at shooting but they're not good at passing so you need someone who can like pass it to them you know um it's rare that you have like a Wayne Gretzky. So I will keep going with the sports. That can just do it all, you know? Yeah, we'll just go all the way. Um, it's rare that you have like a team with five Wayne Gretzkys. It doesn't happen. Really what no. happens is you have people who are like really special at a number of different things, but not everything. And your the success of the team is predicated on your ability to assess those skills and pair them with other folks who who will round out the team. And so building successful teams for project work is what governs success more of the time than not. And it's rare to have superstars, although of course they exist. And so that's honestly what in large form made us good at the fulfillment aspect of the work that we do. Because at a certain point, Brent and I were not working on projects anymore. Yeah. Let's let's dive into this. One last thing and then we'll move on to the next topic. Let's because teams are so important. We already talked about sales. We talked about re referrals. We can dive into sales a little bit more. But in terms of team, teams are just so important when it comes to agency people. Out of the 130 employees, how many of them do you think are like the superstars? Like the Wayne Betskys? Versus how many are like you know, these, these, uh, you know, first liners or second liners, you know, like they're, they're, they're not the superstars, but versus the rookies, like that's your breakdown, like the ratio. Well, I think that it's important to nuance this question with what stage the person is at, because, you know, Wayne Gretzky wouldn't have been ready for the NHL and the Stanley cup, you know, final when he was 12. I'm just using age as a proxy here, right? So okay. there was okay. a point where despite his undeniable skill, he wouldn't have been ready for those situations. And being ready is a degree of like raw talent, communication skills, maturity, um, ability to work with others, et cetera, et cetera. So, and when you think about a superstar, I think most of the time what you think about is someone who can just get it all done. Right. So you, you put them into any situation and they are perfect and they, you know, you can just always pass them the puck and they'll, they'll just have a shot on goal, whether they score or not. Same thing. Um, it's incredibly rare, uh, to see folks like that. And I would say that again, most, we, we absolutely have people who I would like colloquially call superstars on our team, of course, and we have new ones all the time. Sometimes they're in our you know, new group of people that we brought on. And sometimes they've been with us for 10 years, but um, you can't really build uh, an organization around those people because they also come and go, they get traded, right? Like, I don't, I don't like to use the trading analogy because I'm not trading people. Like I try and retain them. Right. But, but at the same time, um, yeah. that's just the reality of the situation. Yeah. And so um, 
a super stardom in this context can take many, many different forms. Like this morning I was uh, going back and forth with someone in our people operations group. And I was like, just so impressed at her communication skills. They surpassed my own, you know, and I, um, I'm not saying I'm the best communicator in the world, but like, I have to be pretty good at it to manage like all kinds of different situations. And so For sure. I was just really impressed. And like, at the same time, I don't work with that person super regularly. And I actually don't know, you know, how they are in certain other aspects of the role. So are they a superstar? Yeah. Probably. I don't know. But sometimes the superstardom and that talent indexes over like one or two of five different areas. And so you just have to play to people's strengths. Imagine a tool that a AI tool that collects all emails, calls, what put and everything and can give you your roster. Like, you know how uh, sports teams can give like a rating, yeah. like, you know, Wayne Vasquez is like 99 and maybe Sidney Crosby is like a 90, 98 or 97 or whatever. And just like do that, like that might be pretty cool now that we're talking about sports. Yeah. Look, I think um, what you're talking about is ultimately using data to inform different team selection decisions. We totally do that. The, the issue is that it's not always like programmatic in nature. So I'm not like feeding all of our digital communication to an AI that's like, this is the team, like it, it would get it wrong, right? And so um, yeah. there needs to be some nuance there and believe it or not, some subjectivity. And uh, at the same time, you know, principles of equity need to be included in these conversations these days. And so, sure. Um, sure. but none of those in absolute form. And so we do collect data of different forms in order to kind of try and assess this, uh, this the inputs to this process is how I would refer to that. And a tool that did that, uh, I don't, maybe they exist, I have no idea, but a tool that did that um, programmatically would be very interesting for sure. Sounds yeah. like you just came up with the idea for your next company. Oh, you have, like, yeah. <laughs> that might be very, very cool. <laughs> uh, yeah, I have all, well, my background, um, I started a couple of agencies as well, 2017 to 2019 so i kind of but i was one of those 90 9, that that didn't grow to your guys' size right um and so i know that the biggest challenge for me was sales i'm not a very good salesperson i'm a really good community builder and i'm a good team builder and so i dove into podcasting and event organized event organizing i feel like i'm a much better community builder than i am you know like salesperson and also maybe i just didn't have the 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 A list Wayne Gretzky team uh, that you had, and I just don't feel comfortable selling something that I'm you know not hundred percent confident with. And you know, as a founder of an agency, you got to do so much. You have to do the sales. You got to do the systems building. You got to you got to do so many things. It's hard man, yeah. I, so many things. Yeah. So first of all, I applaud you for trying. Um, it just so happens that this agency business was like a hit, you know, for me, but <clears throat> I had tried and failed kind of in different nuances at different types of businesses, like five times before I started this one. So if it just so happens that there's an agency skeleton, you know, in your closet, uh, but you move on to find like what you are a superstar at, then just keep trucking, man. That's uh just part of the process, right? So I love these stories where people um, try things and realize what they are not, um, yeah. and then also what they want. And yes. yes, what you are or aren't is just representative of a place in time. It's like a 50 day moving average. You can grow into different things. So just because you had a bad experience with an agency one time, doesn't mean that you'll never be able to run an agency um, yeah. Same thing. Yeah. I mean, one of them is still running, um, just from old, old clients. Uh, but as you know, we're in a bit of a tough market right now. Companies are cutting back their marketing spend and everything. Can you talk to us a little bit about what you're seeing in the market? Like oh, yeah. how are things, how are things going? It's tough out there right now. And um, when I speak to most people who are not, forget about agency, just running businesses, oh, yeah. um, they're making more shrewd decisions. They might be making uh, less hires or investing less in different areas. And they're more concerned with the bottom line. And uh, that's probably also the case with 
our clients and our industry. So, you know, last year in particular, I think for kind of like the first or second time historically, uh, Google and Facebook, their quarterly earnings were going down. And uh, typically, you know, the prior decade that had like kind of never happened. I think Google, we've seen some down quarters historically, but like it's a pretty, you know, high growth company. And so when you see that, it means that as things, you know, go the wrong way in the economy, people are cutting down on advertising and their marketing budgets. And so I would be lying to you if I said that we didn't, you know, get a piece of that in terms of like seeing fewer opportunities and seeing existing clients pull back a bit. So, um, but, but at the same time, I think that the principles of running a good company are that if you do things properly, you'll still kind of always be in demand. And it's, there's this sense in like, in the world, I think that you're running a company and you always have to like make more money and you always have to grow by 20%. Like who, who make, who makes up these numbers? Like why 20% and not, and not 13% or 2% or whatever it is. Yeah. Right. So it goes back to what I said earlier, where it, to me, as long as there's more money, you know, left over or some money left over and more than what we started with, um, it's all good, you know? And so, um, but yeah, it's I'm crazy. Really seeing that out there. We're lucky it, you know, I would, I don't want to use the word lucky. We are in a situation where we are growing. And so, uh, we might be, you know, somewhat unique, uh, in that sense in our sector right now. I honestly don't know. Um, I do speak with a lot of other agency founders, um, and I hear a mix of different things, but my sample size of people that I talk to is relatively small. And so I can't really make a broad generalization, but you know, you can read the New York times and the wall street journal and the financial times and see how tough it is out there. It's pretty public. Yeah, it is brutal. brutal. Yeah. And back to what you're saying, like constantly growing 50% year over year. Imagine if we going back to sports, imagine if we expected you know, Connor McDavid to, to come back, who is the number one player right now in the world, arguably. Imagine we expected him to be 50% better every single year. Like what? It's totally, yeah, it's ridiculous, right? So, so yeah. And I think that, um, also like, I'm just kind of happy. You know what I mean? Like it, it doesn't yeah. always have to be some weird arbitrary target. We've never had to, you know, have layoffs at the company, knock on wood. Um, we've always been profitable, knock on wood. Um, and so it's, you know, I, I'm just happy. And so if we have like up quarters or down quarters or whatever, um, it's fine. You know, I, I don't want uh, people to feel like at the company heads are going to roll or anything. We just, we know how to do what we do. We keep doing it. Sometimes you win, sometimes you take hits. And that's just the way that life is. Everything is like that. Even your relationship with your partner is like that. It's not always like, perfect and it doesn't always get better there are tough times and sometimes it has nothing to do with the two of you right and so uh sometimes uh someone in your world is sick and it puts pressure on your relationship or sometimes you have kids and it puts pressure on your relationship and so there's all these like external factors that can affect you know all you know the performance of a company if you will that have nothing to do with how good the company is it's interesting yeah yeah so you guys are growing, you guys are getting new clients. Can you share any of the newer clients that you've closed recently? Uh, I can share some of them, but the, I would say, unfortunately, the most exciting one I can't share. I don't know if that lands me with a hot sauce penalty here or not, but you know, we'll, this year- We'll see, we'll, we'll see. Sophie will, she will tell me in my ears in a few <laughs> seconds after, after your answer. Okay. Um, this year we started working with uh, Rivian Automotive, Gibson, so the guitar company that you know Jimi Hendrix uh, started. I'm not really sure if that was if he started it or not. No, he didn't start it, but he used a Gibson. Uh, Panasonic, um, Salesforce hired us to do a project for Slack. Um, what else can I talk to you about? Uh, we were just told oh, I'm probably not supposed to talk about this, but Patreon just brought us on. Um, so that's interesting. And then you know, and there's one like really big one that. I can't talk about it. so hot sauce or no hot sauce like what industry um is, is it in communication software what is the what's the first letter of that company no 
<laughs> I've got the, all right, the soul face is screaming in my ear right now, right? It's time. It's time. To... Oh, dear. Right, cheers. Oh, God. It's okay. I love hot sauce, but man, did I pick the wrong one for this. Good thing that I haven't had to eat that too often so far in our discussion. Yeah, it's only been three, so we're good. <laughs> All right, we're going to move over to a fun little segment first. We've heard a, so much about about the company. We're going to do a quick kind of intermission, like sports. Um, it's a joke segment. I'm going to tell you three dad jokes. If you laugh, it's going to be marketing related. So okay. if you laugh, you will take a shot of hot sauce. If you don't, I will. Um, but we'll, we'll, we'll count it up after the three jokes. All right. You ready for the first one? Let's go. I'm going to save the best one for last. Uh, okay. The first joke is. Why did the dad, uh, no. Why was it difficult to date a religious digital marketer? I don't know why. Why is it so difficult? They won't stop trying to convert you. <laughs> it's just so bad. That <laughs> so bad. Okay, wait. Hey, hey, laugh. If, if you don't laugh, if you have two more, if you don't laugh at any of them, we'll, then we'll share it together. We'll, we'll, we'll do good. it together. All right. You just got to do, you just got to not laugh at one of them. So uh, Halloween's coming up. And I wanted to buy some camouflage pants, walk into a store, but I couldn't find any. I'm not going right, to right. one. Okay, that was a good one. All right, this is the last one. This is one I think is actually pretty freaking good. All right. So I'm Asian, right? I'm actually really, I'm really Asian. So my pronouns are he. Go on, go on. That was pretty oh, good. <laughs> uh... All right, we'll boob this one together. Um, so you laughed at two, and you successfully not laughed at one of them. I gotta make something that I can like put this all over tonight. Yeah, cheers. Sorry, I jumped the gun there. But it's all so right. good. Honestly, it's so good. Um, what's the spiciest thing you've ever had? Like the, the spiciest. Uh, I tried a ghost pepper once. Okay. Like the the yeah. type that comes in a little package and you like take off a little little fleck of it and eat it. Oh, okay. That was very painful. So, so you never tried any of the? You ever watched the show uh, Hot Ones? Yeah. First, for sure. from first. Yeah. Have you ever tried any of their like the last dab? Or. Um, uh, so I did. What were we doing? Just a couple of. I Final did a dab. hot sauce tasting with a bunch of my buddies once, and um, everybody had to bring, you know, a different hot sauce. And we just literally went around. We were like playing some dumb game or something, but we went around and each took, you know, one taste after another. And the idea was that it progressively got hotter and hotter, just like that show. And then yeah. uh, one of the people, one of my buddies was like, this is actually one of the hot sauces that was on, you know, uh, hot ones one time. So I've tried it, but yeah, I can't remember the name or anything like that. But you know, what's crazy to me is like some of the, the really, really intense ones, like the ones that you can make like YouTube videos about, it's like, it, people think of it as food. So it like, doesn't hurt you. Yeah. <laughs> I was trying to get yeah. I, yeah. I think, I think uh, we, uh, when you do a podcast and we work, um, yeah. Uh, but it, you can like chemically burn you. Like it, it's like, it's a chemical inside that makes it hot. Right. So you got to be careful with that stuff. So I avoid like the crazy, crazy stuff just cause I don't want to hurt myself. All right. So I'm going to put this on pause and then I'm going to jump back. Okay. So we had to quickly shift rooms, but now, now we're back. Um, so we, we, we talked about thrive digital. We talked about, um, 
just kind of like all, all the different LARPing channels already. Uh, and we did a quick introduction. We uh, successfully made you laugh, Jonathan, so that's good. Now, just gonna, now the audience has made it all the way here. We're about 50 minutes into the show. Um, now let's learn a little bit more about your background. You've kind of touched on your background a little bit already, but what was life like kind of growing up for you? Uh, you lived in a good part of Vancouver, didn't mm-hmm. really have a whole lot of connections to lean on from your family, but what was it like growing up with your parents? Like, like what did they do for, for a living? And like, how was, <clears throat> how was like, family life for you growing up? Right. Um, well, I don't think anybody's ever asked me about my parents. <laughs> Interesting. So my mom was a program manager at the eating disorders clinic at BC Children's Hospital. So she, I grew up kind of hearing her talk about that. And that's part of the reason why, you know, I want to volunteer there at the board level. Um, and then my dad is an architect and an engineer, and he kind of worked with different organizations that were building all kinds of different buildings and represented them and helped, you know, manage that process, I guess. So both my parents were professionals. My mom had a nursing background. Um, and so I grew up in like a, you know, environment with two very dedicated professional parents. And so it was a really good grounding. And um, we lived in Carisdale, but we were, we rented in Carisdale. So all of my friends, you know, um, owned homes, uh, we rented, I, I developed a bit of a chip on my shoulder, I think, because we were definitely like the least well off family in my entire cohort of people at my high school. Um, you know, there are probably some others, uh, were in my shoes or whatever, but like, you know, and this is in like the mid nineties to the early two thousands, our television was from like the 1970s and like, you know, it, my parents like didn't have a lot of money. Um, so I think that from a business point of view, I was kind of always like, what can I do to not be in these circumstances and no knock on my, my parents, they did everything they possibly could for the kids, but it kind of was like the, the bedrock foundation of um, me wanting to be successful and, and the degree of ambition that I ended up having. So a little bit of a chip on the shoulder there. Then um, I had an experience where my parents would give me like five bucks a week for allowance. I'd have to wash all the dishes and stuff like that or whatever. So I went and got a, they, you know, they, they were like, we're not giving you more money. Uh, go get a job. And so at the age of like 16, 17, I went and worked at a restaurant in Vancouver and I was a dishwasher. And I distinctly remember like slicing my finger open one night. I'm like bleeding all over my, my whites. Um, I was like neck to toe wow. covered in like water and food. And like, How I you? probably 17, um, maybe 16. I took a step back and I was like, I don't want this. I want something better. I need an education and I need to make something of myself. And so um, that was like a turning point for me. You know, I was a kid in high school, like you don't really know much about yourself at that stage, but it was an early realization for me that I wanted something more. And that was the beginning of my, you know, attempts at being entrepreneurial, which started off as it does with a lot of young entrepreneurs in the world of event production, because kids want to have a good time. And I was one of them and I saw opportunities to organize events where we could all go and party and I would charge tickets for tickets. And so I learned how to like run events and it was like kind of like running a real business, but like not really. And yeah. Mm, wow. Um, let, let's keep going. This is, this is, uh, this is awesome. So after you did that, you, you were what, like 20, 20 ish, early twenties around that time. Yeah. So, well, I went to UVic and through that process, uh, I continued to, um, do event production. Uh, it turned into also working with like talent. So bands and musicians, and I was both an agent where I would book shows, a producer where I would put the shows on and then a manager where I would try and work with talent and develop the talent type thing. Um, meanwhile you were going to school, sorry. Yeah, I did all that while I was in school. Yeah. Yeah. But, but it did make me enough money so that I didn't have to work those weird jobs in the summer as much, I would say. So my friends would work, you know, three months at a coffee shop. I'd only have to work three weeks at the coffee shop or one month at the coffee shop to make sure I had enough money, you know, for the following year and stuff like that. So I was kind of like, okay, there's something here. 
And I knew at a certain point that, you know, it's really hard to make it in music and entertainment. And so at a certain point I was like, okay, like I've got to figure something else out. Um, and that kind of resulted in me guessing and testing. I actually went into real estate for a period of time. That's where I learned kind of my business. That's where I honed my business acumen. And I had some really tough bosses, um, which at the, was like the awful tasting medicine. But now I look back at fondly because they really instilled this like intense work ethic. And I learned how to do deals and I had a lot of confidence around like paperwork and contracts and stuff like that, which a lot of people are scared of, but really it's just English and you have to like understand what the paper says type thing. And so as sales, did you learn much? Yeah, it was essentially, it was essentially a, a sales role basically. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so, you know, and, then eventually, uh, I, I started a digital signage company, which was a massive failure. No offense to like the other person that I started it with, uh, who was, who's great. I still am friends with him. Um, but we kind of were just like too early and it was like a bad business idea. Um, so I lost a bunch of money there. I ended up falling into affiliate marketing and building websites that would like, you know, generate referrals and I'd get a commission off the referrals. That was really interesting, but I thought having built a website, through like, you know, teaching myself, essentially, I was like, Oh, I should really learn how to do this professionally. Maybe this is what I want to do. And so I went to BCIT and I studied web development and design. And I thought I was going to be a web pardon. How old were you at that time when you started? Like 27, 28. Yeah. And actually this was a low point for me. So, um, I had failed a lot at things I had had, if you looked at my resume at that point, it was like a dog's breakfast of like, digital signage company, real estate, event production. Like it was weird, like unhirable almost. Um, uh, and, and yet, you know, I drag myself to BCIT, think I'm going to be a web developer and then realize that I, I am like obsessed with search engine optimization. And I, because I had studied web development, I tried to be a web developer for a while, by the way, and like no one liked what I did and no one wanted to hire me, but I knew how websites worked. And so by the time I then, you know, get into SEO, I'm the person that's sitting around the the boardroom table that can answer really deeply technical questions. And like, you can put me in a room with like the front end and back end engineers, and I can explain like how to think through a solution to a problem that is hindering organic search results, you know, in the context of visibility of their website and stuff like that. And so that was awesome. And it was the first time that I was like, oh, I have like an actual skill set, like, That is amazing. Like I, you know, being an entrepreneur is certainly a skill set, but this was like real practical skills. And I had never really had like a profession before. So then I married my, you know, profession with my entrepreneurship interests and the long, you know, the short of the story is that Thrive comes out of that. And I never looked back. So, um, and I love what I do. Like I honestly, um, it does, you know, I I probably don't need to work that much in the future, but I love it. And I wouldn't have a life without good hard work in it because I think that's like healthy. Um, And I just really like what I do. It doesn't feel like work when I'm like working. Right. So, so it's good. It's good stuff. I'm, I'm, I'm proud of uh, some of our accomplishments. I certainly did not do it alone. You know, like I, I, we've talked about the team a lot, but I was able to kind of, arrive at where I'm at because I had such an incredible group of people around me. And that's not just work. Work is one part, but like my family has been really supportive. I'm in an amazing, you know, relationship, which isn't perfect all the time. It doesn't mean that it just means that like you all collectively want the same stuff through the ups and downs and you put one foot in front of the other, You keep making good choices and good decisions, hopefully. Uh, and you end out on top that way. And so that's, you know, in a nutshell, how I got to where I'm at. Amazing. Amazing. Well, Jonathan, you've been, uh, you've been an amazing guest. We, we dove into so many different parts. Uh, I've learned a lot from you. Really appreciate you. And we live close to each other relatively same city. So we'll definitely have to bring this in real life at some points. Um, but for the, for the people listening, made it all the way here, interested in, in hearing what you're doing, what's the best way for people to kind of follow along your journey and learn about what you're, what you're up to? 
Um, thank you for that. I think um, I'm on LinkedIn uh, under my name, Jonathan Becker. And on Twitter, I'm under JZ Becker. And I don't tweet that often, but when I do, it's because I think that there's something interesting. And certainly um, you're welcome to reach out to Thrive if you're curious or interested about either working there or uh, working with us as a service provider. Uh, thrivedigital.com is our website. Amazing. Well, Jonathan, thank you so much. We'll talk soon. Thanks so much for having me. Hey, hope you enjoyed that episode. I know I did. My mouth was burning on fire for about 30 minutes there. So I had to take a quick break before I recorded this. But I really just wanted to say thank you for tuning in. Most of us work at home nowadays and we're all just in our pajamas, in our t-shirts and in our hoodies. It just feels really fun and really light. And that's the kind of vibe that I'm trying to give. If there's anything that you want to add into the show, new segments or new topics to talk about, feel free to throw it into the comments below. Thank you so much again would not be here without your support. Until next time, peace out. Hope to see you soon.